start with a few images that will hopefully give some insight into my very long-standing interest in interiors. And it is quite long-standing. If I go back to childhood, um, authors and illustrators like Dr. Seuss were early sparks to my imagination, and particularly the way he depicts the architectural elements and space in a really fantastic way. And when I was growing up, my favorite place, this may sound a little weird, was the period rooms and museums. And I would make a beeline for those and imagine all kinds of royal dramas being played out in the space. Um, back at home, I was constantly rearranging the furniture in my house. This is the period room, not my house. And um, I think it was an effort to exert some control over my environment, you know, at a time in one's life where you don't have much control, but your, your home is your sphere. And because furniture and interiors figured so prominently in my imagination, surrealist painters, and particularly some of the women painters like Remedio Sparrow, um, with their interest in objects as symbols and dream imagery, were a big influence on me. And while it's not my picture, I'll just mention that the orange on the screen is way too bright. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> that be my one disclaimer. So this is a very early photograph of mine, and it's a portrait of my sister. And I think that even then, I was as interested in the sofa, um, and I don't know if you can tell there's a little lizard crawling around on the back of the sofa, but this sofa almost became my muse. Um, and I worked in different media. Uh, one thing I started doing was making objects to photograph, so I upholstered this couch and sort of put the piano keys out in this sort of surrealist object way. And I made digital collage where I could create the space from scratch, still the red sofa. And this is a monotype. And one source of inspiration was this recurring dream I had of being in a huge pink room and a maze of red sofas and being chased through this room. Sometimes it was a snake, sometimes it was a coyote. Um, and that kind of, here's a pretty good representation of that. And this is a fabric collage that I made. But with the photographs, I realized early on that while I was considering them constructed fictions, not unlike the other work I was doing, um, the viewers weren't sure whether they were being presented with reality or not. And writers like Rosalind Krauss and Susan Sontag have written that photography is the perfect medium for surrealism because of its privileged connection to the real world. So a photograph has a status of a trace, almost. We think of it that way, that it's the light reflecting off the objects that make the representation almost like a fingerprint. So I found that viewers were drawn in by the familiarity of the scene or the reality of the scene, only to find that things weren't quite right. So in this case, you know, is the bed being taken apart or put back together? Is it broken? You know, more questions are raised. And this feeling of the simultaneously familiar and strange is how Freud describes the phenomenon of the uncanny. And the German word for uncanny is unheimlich, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. But he traces the roots of that word to unhomelike. And he writes that it's the name for all that ought to have remained secret and hidden, but has come to light. And so an uncanny effect can come about from destabilized opposition. So for example, um, a confusion between the real and imaginary. And I think in this image, this is, this is a window with a view to a landscape beyond, but it's sort of fuzzy and almost looks like a painting or a mirror. Um, you can have a confusion between animate and inanimate. So this static piece of furniture, this sofa, um, has carved animal feet and the fur throw on top of it. And this, this wall is covered with fur, fake fur, but it sort of animates the space and then, and then you have the cat, a real animal, still in the foreground with a line through space. <laughs> And a confusion between absence and presence. So there never are people in the photographs, 
Um, but often a sense that somebody has just walked out of the frame or about to return to the space. And I was going to touch just a little bit on my technical process here. Um, I shoot large format film, I'm still shooting film, and uh, I get a 4 inch by 5 inch negative, which gives me a lot of resolution, we would call it now, a lot of detail. So um, there are things that I'll point out, and I have some details of the images that you would see in a print quite easily that are harder to see on the display. Um, but with large format, you often have longer exposures than you're used to. So I bring my lights with me and you know, light the scene. And one strategy that you can see here is a very brightly lit scene, and it sort of helps saturate the colors and almost creates this hyperreal sense to the scene. And in others, I let it be more dramatic, let the light sources that are in the image be the main source of light. And then the long exposure exaggerates these shadows. And I think that's another source of uneasiness that might creep into some of the pictures. This is a photograph um, by Jeff Wall. It's called Ventriloquist at a Birthday Party. And he and other contemporary photographers like Philip Lorca de Corsia create these images that problematize the notion of a middle class ideal by creating um, you know, these images that are really full of pathos and anxiety and sometimes isolation. Um, this is Sandy Scogland, and um, I think she's working with some of the same ideas. And another aspect of all their work that resonates with me is the use of an implied narrative or an open-ended narrative. So Scoglin creates these constructions um, that, ha that have a lot of anxiety to them, but the viewer can only wonder what led to this squirrel takeover and how it will end. <laughs> and my work, I think, is also about storytelling, but again, really requires the viewer to take some creative initiative. Um, and it's also particularly referencing middle class lifestyles, but again, not without paradox and tension. So, you know, you have this tub and the cord stretched across it is a little fraught. And the embroidery, here's where I have a detail, um, says forget me not. This framed print on the wall is kind of the ultimate idealized domestic interior from Versailles, you know, a castle, palace. Um, and the furniture is, you know, a replica of that style and it's miniature. But here, uh, the towel on it is sort of futilely protecting it from pet hair that's all over it. And I'm fascinated by objects and surfaces that mimic other things. So you have the fake Christmas tree, you know, white plastic Christmas tree. But even the sofa is naugahyde, which is a leather substitute, right? So something that is more accessible financially to people that, than the real leather. And this runner in the hallway, it's linoleum masquerading as carpet at a time when carpet was out of the reach of many people in the middle class, they would actually print linoleum to look like a carpet. And again, it's hard to tell, but it actually has the weaving in the print on the linoleum. And there's all kinds of levels of genuine and artificial here. So the real wood floor, the wood paneling, um, it almost looks like some bizarre forest with an owl lamp in back. And then under the bed, um, is cardboard, which is wood, but printed with a wood grain, you know, as just another level of separation. And I love, you know, the clash of era here. You can tell that it's a modern home just from the window, those few architectural details. And again, the 18th century replica of furniture. But what also interested me is this condensation on the window. And it almost seemed like that lush greenery outside was creeping in. And I started thinking about, you know, that's one more thing that the home is supposed to protect us from is the weather and the elements. Um, blizzards, right? Th these windows are just covered with snow that's come down in a blizzard. And while windows 
keep the elements out, they also bring the, the outside into a home. And it's almost, in certain cases, with beautiful views that they're framed like a painting through the window. Here's another that works that way. And other times, when we don't have a window, a painting can stand in for that. So the landscape painting, and it's almost like this deer has escaped the painting, and yet he's being blocked by this monolithic um, coffee table. This is an aquarium set in the wall, but again, it kind of looks like a painting or a window, but it's another way of bringing the natural world into a home, but in this very mediated way. Um, and you know that's a theme that, that, that has been coming up in my work over and over, this idea that the home is a refuge, but also a recreation of the outside world. And the pattern on the wallpaper, little rolling hills and farmhouses, and you know the irony is if you were to walk down the hallway and look out the window, that's what you would see. It's a farmhouse, <laughs> so they have to sort of repeat that indoors. Or this one. <laughs> complete confusion of exterior and interior, and this is actually inside the home. It's a stairway going down to the kitchen. And sometimes, you know, we, we build these homes or we, ha we surround ourselves with objects that just let us imagine that we are living in a cave. Um, and I love this, this nook that doesn't go anywhere, but it's just so interesting to me that it was like built into the wall or this plush carpet made to look like a patio. And even the house plants, you know, our need to cultivate life and greenery inside the home. And we use that, you know, on rugs, the foliage on the, the rug here and the house plant. Um, but of course, this repurposed canoe, you know, it's like bring the canoe inside and use it as a coffee table. Or imagine that you live in a jungle. I think it's a little hard to see, but these are you know, jungle leaves patterns that are not only on the wallpaper, but the upholstery as well. And then you have your telescope so that you can actually look outside of all of that jungle. We're living in town, in a village, or a forest where the forest just surrounds the home and runs right inside. And the home is also where we spend time with family and friends. So I, at one point, was thinking about, you know, what are, what are some of the leisure activities? So this is a Monopoly game laid out in the cabin, or a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle on a rainy day. The dartboard, you know, but on the world map, which is pretty wonderful. And then, and then the redundancy of the globe. You need a globe and a map <laughs> to know where you are. And home is where we dream of getting away from home and learning about other places. So the map, you know, to plan a vacation or, you know, images of the pyramids in Egypt, even in your cabin in the woods. Or to imagine sailing away to a tropical place as you enjoy your cocktail in your basement in Maine. And home is also where we have intimate relationships, and uh, I like these sort of ironic depictions of romance. They're sort of like a creepy date scene. <laughs> or this bedroom. Um, the view through the window, I have a detail, is a scoreboard. Yeah. You can tell that better, so that's helpful, I guess. <laughs> And I've been looking at these representations of animals and wildlife for a while. This is, this is a, a wooden lion guarding the stairs, this very dizzying stairwell. Um, but I started to think more explicitly about the repercussions and psychology of living with animals, so pets, not, not wildlife now, and the ways that we honor them and are dedicated to them in paintings. Um, these are all paintings of the same German Shepherd Earl. And we decorate with their image, so this black cat on the couch with like, it seems like his black cat pillow, <laughs> and it seems like his sofa, you might recognize that sofa. 
and the peculiar status of pets themselves. They have this sort of in-between place in our lives in that they're still animals with predator-prey instincts, but very much family members and creatures of comfort. So this cat um, lying in front of the fire on this representation of her you know, ancient ancestor, but there's no way she wants to go out in that snow. Maybe the fire is much, uh, much more comfortable. This is a black lab from a championship duck hunting line, and yet she's completely oblivious to the static representation of her prey, these duck lamps flanking her. In this white room, and I, I was talking about this picture right after I made it, and I, I said, um, oh, you know, these people love white so much that they, they had to get a white cat. And then I was speaking to the people whose house it was, and I told them I had told that story, and they said, well, you know, that's really funny you say that, because the opposite is true. We had the cat first, and then we decorated the room for the cat. <laughs> so I love sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. And so thinking about the pets, you know, this one-eyed dog, and almost like his portrait on the pillow, and even the carpet has a reference to his spots. Um, and this cabin, um, the portrait on the back, I have a detail, I don't know if you can see, but it's this very dapper cat. <coughs> and through that, I started thinking more broadly about the images we hang in our homes um, and the people. And one of the first questions I used to always get about my work is why don't you photograph people? And so now you can't ask me that because now I'm photographing people, sort of. Um, <laughs> so thinking about these kinds of portraits and what they, what they say about our longing for connection to the past, so ancestors, these are um, silhouettes in the frames, which is actually a precursor to photography. And I love how the black and white of the silhouette kind of echoes the black and white pattern on the doors. And the portraits can speak to, you know, family, but also our past selves. So it's an old photograph of these two sisters and their twin beds. And even celebrities that we feel an affinity for. This is um, Louise Brooks, a 1920s film star, and how it points to a certain taste um, of the homeowner and then reflected in that, that mirror. And I don't know who this guy is, but I thought he was pretty wonderful. And he's all beat up, and it sort of references the cracks in the walls in the room and, and other elements within the room. And historical figures, these are all different kinds of portraits that I've been finding. Um, and these, uh, I have detail of these because these are uh, George and Martha Washington. So again, like, displaying this interest in history or maybe even patriotism through these images. Or your own heritage, this is the Swedish royal family presented here. And appropriated cultural icons, so it's like the cowboys all over the wallpaper and then the Native American chief on the painting. And in this one, I. I have two details because I love this combination of cultural icons. So um, the print, one of the prints on the wall is Napoleon, um, and the pillow is this leopard lady. <laughs> and I was just going to finish with a passage from a novel uh, written by Italo Calvino. Um, the novel is If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, which is a mouthful. Um, but it's a book I read years ago, and this passage always stayed through me, th with me throughout all of this work. So he writes, your relationship with objects is selective, personal. Only the things you feel yours become yours. And once they are attached to you, marked by your possession, the objects no longer seem to be there by chance. They assume meaning as em elements of a discourse, like a memory composed of signals and emblems. Are you possessive? Perhaps there is not enough evidence to tell. For the present, it can be said that you are possessive toward yourself, that you are attached to the signs in which you identify something of yourself, 
fearing to be lost with them. And that's it. And I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>